Welcome to our Bucky weekend call of uh, July 30th and July 30, 31st. Uh, we're going to continue with our discussion of uh, des uh, design discipline, uh, Utopia or Oblivion. Even though I changed those words around, that's the book that we're reviewing here. Manu, how are you feeling and what do you expect to get out of today's call? I'm feeling good despite uh, an un insufficient uh, <laughs> sleep. But anyway, I hope I'm going to be kind of up and uh, awake during this call. Uh, what I expect is that we continue. I'm really keen about the self-disciplines, the number 12 on the list. Oh, I don't know, I can't remember it very well. 14. So I, yes, what I'm looking for is for us to progress towards that. And then I think at that level, we can talk a lot about applica applications, you know? Yeah. And that's what I expect. Um, Joe, what do you feel? What do you expect? I, uh, I feel lucky to be here and it's good to see everybody. Uh, I too am dealing with uh, some inf insufficient sleep as well. Uh, but I'm sure Manu is much better, better equipped to deal with less sleep than I am. Um, uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see everybody. And uh, I'm just looking forward to actually getting more into the text of Utopia and Oblivion and really kind of focusing, uh, um, you know, in, uh, in kind of just uh, trying to see the whole. That's what I actually want to say. I, I, I kind of just did a little bit of introspection today, and I really want to focus on being able to uh, really understand terms and understanding a way to look at things from a macro level and then be able to drill down. Uh, and I need to work on that. That's something I need to work on. Um, so that's what I want to work. That's what I hope to take away from today is just to, and I think utopian and oblivion really lends itself to that. Susan, my friend, it's so wonderful to see you and it's even better to see your smile. It is, it's, uh, how are you doing and what would you like to take away from today? And I miss Kelly too. I would also like to say. I, I agree, Miss Kelly. Um, the cats seem to be drawn into time with you as, as much as I am. Um, I am very, very appreciative of this time. And this is the designated metaphysical discipline in my life right now. I don't go to a standard church. I don't have another practitioner that I'm spending time with necessarily. I just spent the afternoon with a girlfriend who is certified as a um, priestess in goddess culture. Um, she's 86 and she's mm. fabulous. And uh, so she has a wealth of experience to draw on. And, and Joe, it's funny because in my conversation with her, she, she visits with a couple of uh, channeling people on a regular basis. So getting, again, infinite intelligence from the other side tapping in. And, and really, we are talking about why are more people not, in Bucky parlance, spontaneously arousable? And, you know, how terrible, it, how rough it might be uh, if you're a human being going through life and you're not open if you're not apprehending in a way that's positive, if you're only apprehending in a way that's negative. Um, so that invitation to look at things from that bigger macro perspective, I, I think it's our best protection against, um, against oblivion. And I mean, oblivion to me now has a very, very um, clear structure in society at large, both globally and here in the US. Um, whether we're talking about inoculations and that strategy, what's happening to food, what's happening to our environment, um, what's happening in our politics. And so I, I really, really appreciate that through the pursuit of stable datum, um, as we, you know, and I love Steve's persistence about you know, diving in on each one of these terms and, and let's see the pictures and how would it look if you put that in motion and, um, I think that provides stable datum on, on just such a rich basis. And Bucky was able to do that. He was able to, to look out at nature and go into 
cosmic accounting uh, with a spirit of integrity and understanding the regenerative nature of things. So I'm excited to, to keep expanding in that perspective. Steve, my friend, how are you feeling and what are you looking to unpack, you know, get into today? Wow. Um, I'm just excited to be here and this idea of looking deeply at the topology, uh, <laughs> the very beingness of the universe is really exciting for me. Somehow uh, trying to figure out what Bucky's saying um, it just really helps me realize that I, I really don't know anything and I've got to, I've got to look, I've got, I got to look deeper or wider or something. Um, and it just seems like every time I start to understand, or I think I'm understanding what Bucky's saying, then he brings up what we're talking about today, like Euler's <laughs> formulas on topology and, and, and whoa, all of a sudden that is really deep. And, uh, but we're going to take a look at it. And I do agree with the comments tonight that uh, hopefully reading this book and what, what Manu said, you know, there are, he's going to establish these 14 disciplines. And I don't know that any going into one of them in any depth is as valuable as taking a look at all 14 of them and how they interrelate. And that is a really powerful invitation. So that's where I'm going. That's where I'm looking for. I did get an email from, I got an email from Kelly saying he wasn't really feeling up to the calls and he's going to take a vacation for a little while. So we're not to expect him uh, and we can continue to send him good wishes and, and prayers. And I did get an email from Ann saying that she was at a 60th high school reunion. So 60th. Yeah. She, she's a young, sweet thing. Young looking. Yes, sweet. she is. She yeah. sure is. Sure is. I would have yeah. never guessed that. Yeah. Wow. So, she said 60th so i don't know if maybe she could have said 40th and i would have believed it maybe yeah. maybe well Next maybe she graduated and she was 12 i don't know and so, uh, has anybody heard an update i mean we haven't been seeing Raphael, and that's fine as long as he's good um, i haven't heard an update i would just like to know that things are good in his in his universe yeah yeah me too I've sent him an a, a individual email on occasion over the last month or so, and he hasn't replied. So if you guys want to make an effort to do that and see if he responds. Absolutely. I just didn't know if he was in touch with anybody personally. He seemed to be kind of closer to Manu. Yeah. Oh, you're we mute, can't hear you're Manu. Muted, you're on mute. You're on I'm, mute. Yeah. <laughs> I was sorry, I was coughing and then I, but uh, the last, you know, I, I have Raphael on uh, WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And the last message I have from me in the 15th of June, I Manu, I'm afraid that I won't be able to join you today. Please send my regards to our Bucky group. And since I can see that somebody, you know, like his, his number is active because you can see that he was active, but he hasn't been able to. Let me just send a message now and see what. All right. I'll send him a quick message. And then yeah. I'll go pick up John Butler to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because... Usually I that was a long trip that he's been on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold him to his word next time. He said, I was going away. I'm going away next weekend. And, and that means you're coming back the following weekend. Um, it, anyway. it, I, I, you know, even if it's just, and it, it's so much easier for me to, to actually show up and be on the Wednesday morning calls. This one is a little bit harder. Um, but I would, I would hate to miss the people that can only make it to this. Hmm. Okay. I just checked my weird email and, uh, while Manu is checking for raffers, Julian thought he'd be here a little bit late. The, uh, the butlers declined uh, without any particular message regarding uh, any reason. And uh, and I've had a few other declines uh, during the week, but that's it. Mm. And 
And so good. Well, while Manu is checking on that, we'll go ahead and start our um, 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 Oh, and there's a comment here about the chat box issue. Unresolved. Yeah, we still can't message each other. All right, I'm going to privately. I'm going to check with Zoom and find out what that is. I may have turned that off because I was doing some calls uh, and I didn't want any back, um, any uh, side talking. Uh, I'll check with Zoom on the on, on on Universal Chat. So if anybody wants to side talk, they can side talk. That's cool. Okay, cool. Um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, begin on our, um, here's our um, Utopia or Oblivion. And when we left off last time, we left off uh, with this last sentence about Euler and, and some of his, uh, his topology. And we can continue reading from here. I read ahead and found out that he's going to talk about Kepler's third law, and I've got a little something on that if we want to go there, at least show you a diagram of what that's about. But, uh, <laughs> but Joe, here you go. <laughs> All right, you, let's go. All right. And if you do get tired and want to change off, just holler out and say, it's your turn, Steve, and I'll be glad to jump in. All right, I will. Your, right. It's your turn, Steve. No, I'm just <laughs> The power of synergy was demonstrated once again by physicists in modern quantum mechanics, in which the assumption of a finite physical energy universe always requires a 100% accountability of all energy transactions. Synergetic accounting of the finite system plays a major part in the success of modern nuclear physics. Kepler third Kepler's third law and Newton's theory of gravity provided synergetic advantage for astronomy. Willard Gibbs' phase rule, akin to Euler's topological equation of the re relative abundance of basic mathematical patterns aspects, provided synergetic advantage in chemistry. Let's pause right there. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I think Bucky's saying right here is that you can't have an atomic bomb without being 100% accountable for every aspect uh, of, of the of the physical reality of what's going on. And, you know, whereas farming and other kinds of industrial aspects in a Western culture, there are all sorts of byproducts that are created that are that end up being pollution, right? They're not right. wanted because there isn't 100% accountability. But I note here that in quantum physics, that somehow that there has to be cosmic uh, accounting of the finite system and plays a major part of the success of nuclear physics. I thought that was kind of profound and worth thinking about again. Mm. And then you read, go ahead, any other comments or questions? And again, sometimes I you know, just partake in some period pieces and I love going back in history and finding where people looking at a process say that, you know, when um, Henry Clay Frick mm. was, was smelting Coke, and there was this gas that came that came off the top and it, and it would condense down into liquid. And, and somebody finding, oh my gosh, you know, some of the leftover processes produced kerosene. Some of the leftover processes in, in other situations produced gasoline. And, and then, oh, on the hideous side of that is the people that were processing cotton and so they had all the cotton seeds, you know, that you would take out. And so initially they would press the cotton seeds and get an oil and they would send that, they could sell part of that to the Ford Motor Factory to use for, um, for their machines. And then there was still plenty of it left over. And the question is, what can we do with this? And then people came up with a way to treat it with more chemicals and to pull the color out and the smell out and then they started feeding it to animals and they turned it into Crisco and they started feeding it to humans. And so it's part of the devolution, part of it, bastardization of our nutrition. I mean, those, those fats that were never meant to be food for humans, they're part of the membranes that make up our, our skin cells, make up our neurons, make up the lining over our nerves. 
they're part of us and they're pollution. And sometimes that transition of pollution into something useful is, is beautiful and fabulous and regenerative, but sometimes it's, it's, it's all there. I mean, we, it, each part is still plain. Right. Well, and I think it's to our Western culture's uh, demise that we haven't been sensitive to that, that it's all been profit driven. Oh, let's see what we can do. Can we make money with cotton seeds? Okay, what do we got to do to it? Oh, we'll make Crisco, you know, and then 50 years later, we find out that there, there's this obesity <laughs> beyond, you know, that's creating all sorts of medical issues, costing us hundreds of millions, if not right. millions of dollars, right? Wow. But the, the dollars are really not the thing that gets me with that stuff. It's the lost potential. Yeah. Right. Thought potential, the lost life potential. And I'm sorry, I know I, again, I tend to go down micro rabbit holes on the stuff that is, that's in my genre. Um, I love it though. But sometimes I'm so excited about how we, we thought something was a bad leftover, a bad bit of pollution. And when we figure out how to look at it correctly, it's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But it's all there. It's always yeah. it's always all there. It right. really is. I no, I mean I, I I've talked about this in the past, like how you know just there are certain companies that are able to figure out what to do um, with a problem. And, 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 and actually make it work for them. And, and, and I've talked about in the past how Amazon has done that. You know, they, they were buying servers all the time and then they actually started building their own cloud and then they said, oh, we can sell this cloud. And, you know, that's a positive way. But and they actually shifted, I think, from what they thought they were and how they defined themselves. Wasn't that a pivoting point for them? Yeah, it was. I mean, they, I mean, if Andy Jassy is actually the CEO now is actually from their cloud business. Um, it became their biggest service offering too. Yeah. Um, and and you know, as I've said in the past, is that you know what he saw, what Bezos saw, that was that everybody else was. He said, "Well, well there's not a lot of money in this," and, and he's like, "No, you providing the infrastructure for the internet, <laughs> and so that there's a whole lot of stuff. It's like a developer that comes in and looks at a piece of land and develops the land, and you know what? You you can build your building here." But, you know, basically I'm going to, I own the sidewalks, I own the wall, you know, I own the roads, I own the 7-Eleven up the road, and I own everything around here. You're going to buy all my tools, you're going to buy my storage, my DynamoDB database, uh, I'm going to, you're going to buy my Redshift analytics tools. But anyway, that, that's a good example of, what, of using, of finding out what, you know, how to use, you um, what like you're building a cloud you have something that's left over you can sell it you know in this particular instance so and that's an example of good accounting exactly and and we talked a little bit i shared a little thing last week on factored real estate and and one of the things i've heard is that uh, saudi arabia has purchased a lot of land in arizona and there are water rights that go with land, but there's no limit. If you can drill down and suck it out, you can suck it out. And so I've understood that in Arizona, which is not the best place to grow wheat, that the, that the Saudi Arabia has bought this arid ground, drilling down in, sucking the water out and growing wheat and then shipping the wheat to Saudi Arabia and just basically taking the water. And there's no accounting for the water. And one of the big issues that we have in the Intermountain area and all the way down through Montana, through Utah, Colorado, down into San Diego, oh, is sorry. we have these water right issues that are based on water tables that were established 100 years ago. And we've had decades of drought after drought after drought. And the meander lines are dropping, the water tables are dropping, and we're still operating on 100 year old water accountability tables. And oh, that's and not cosmic accounting go ahead susan i i freaking love that term meander lines oh yeah oh that's gonna be that's gonna play for me oh okay yeah uh, you know what a, and a meander line is what a lake does over a period of time they take a like a 30-year average and say okay this is what the lake is how it meanders 
you know, bigger or smaller. And then they take this 30 or 40 year of average and they call it a meander line. There was a big thing in Utah where uh, in order to create a cloud on a title, people were quick claiming property they didn't own, but they were quick claiming it to these multiple little corporate LLCs they'd made in order to establish some chain of title that was totally fictitious and trying to establish some right of ownership on land that was supposed to be inside the lake. <laughs> I just so there because people don't do cosmic accounting they don't look at anything more than what's right in front of them normally well and i think so much and i wish roffers was here our, our linguist i think it's because in our generations we have been so conditioned to economic languaging and yeah. economic conceptioning where it's about expense it may they may look at a an expense, but they don't look at a cost. Yeah, right. The rest of us, the rest of us on the planet, get to bear the cost. That's right. But they're looking at a ledger. What what they can get away with is what shows up on the ledger. Yeah, and the principle is called fully burdened accounting. I didn't realize it until you were just talking. Bucky calls it cosmic accounting, and in the time there has been what's called a fully burdened accounting, which is avoided. Uh, most corporations, most companies are on short-term quarterly profits. That's it. And we'll, we'll, we'll shift our accounting around to create those quarterly profits. Interesting. Any other comments or questions on that part? Welcome, Julian. We got your email and acknowledged you'd be here a little bit after time. Glad you're here. Yeah, glad you're here. Glad you're here. It's good to see you. Uh, we can't hear you, though. Even that you're, uh, yeah, we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me? There, now, we, now can. we can. Okay. Hi, how are you, everyone? Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm happy to be here also. Um, today, um, my throat is not very well. I just uh, had COVID this week. Oh. So ah. I am not willing to uh, talk too much. I will try to keep it uh, short. But yeah, I, I think um, this is going to be even even with that. This is I hope this can be fun. Yeah. So um, thank you. And remember, you got the chat thing there. So anytime you want to talk without using your voice, just type in some stuff and we'll read it for you. And then you can come in with a one or awesome. two comment if you like. OK, sounds good. Thank you. Save your voice. OK, we'll continue with our reading. Um, and I can think I comment here. Oh, go Please ahead. do. Please do. Okay, I would I'm just waiting. like to bring a metaphor. Good. You know, imagine kids are playing and there is there's a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. Or there is a stream in the groove that carries things, small boats, toys that are floating. And you're at one of the corner and recesses and then the river comes and there is there is a boat you just take it away and you go at the first sight the first sight of anything that is of interest to you take it away right so if you have stayed if you have looked at it maybe put it back on the stream and waited for a while you have seen everything that the stream has in store for you to see or to choose from. So in that metaphor, the lesson is the self-discipline of patience is one of the keys that allows you to completely account for patience and openness. Because you don't know, say for example, I'm starting a business. I do something. There is no way that I'm going to, before I just plan everything comprehensively. What I'm going to do though, is one, be open to the possibility that something completely different out of what I plan might happen. Second, be ready to listen to that 
and seize it at the moment to try to understand what it is that I can do with and third, to be patient to wait for that to happen and then act. So that's what is, in other words, I have to be adaptive. It is my, my whole design has to be dynamic and adaptive. Right? So that's that's what that's that's the contribution I wanted to make here onto the discussion. Cool. Comments, questions? So what I just got out of what Manu said is sometimes the most difficult thing to see when you're trying to account for a system is what happens in the lag. Right. Right. Because we that lag could have all different terms of calibration. Uh, increments for calibration. Yeah. yeah. And, and remember, it's always a problem of the interaction between the me here and the general going on there. You see? Mm. And that's a little again, How do I, you know, have a power to decide a choice? What do I choose of this, which doesn't depend on me. It just happened to be it. He's doing it. How do I choose? Will determine what I begin, what I become. And you just uh, showed us an example. You, you just showed us locality. Yeah. I mean, the me is all about locality. It's all, in, to me, is about your choices. And how does that affect the general? But ultimately, you know that the general will always be able to dispose of you. Always, because it always applies. Thank you, Julian. Okay. Um, if should we make that comment, Julian, shall I read that? It's also related with immediacy, the importance of acting versus overthinking was Julian's point. Okay, let's continue reading. Wherever you left off, Joe. I think, did you already read about Kepler's third law over here and basically I did. mechanical paths and aspects? I just thought it'd be interesting because I looked up Kepler's laws and Kepler's three laws, in fact, and um, the third law is has to do with it, it's pretty complicated, but let me see if I can uh, show the picture of um, maybe I can't show it. Maybe I, I'm speaking. Yeah, you can. Wow, that's a nice calendar there. Oh, is it? <laughs> no, uh, no, but it, you you missed the the box to click. So if you go back. There you go. Now, well, I know, but I'm. I was trying to bring this guy up, and I yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah, but you, it's you not had a, it. Did I? You had it. That, so wait a minute. That's okay. I'm going to load it in here. All right. And so now we're on a Wikipedia page talking about Kepler's laws, and the Kepler's laws relate to the orbit of a planet is an eclipse with the sun at one of the two foci. That's the first law. The a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. That's number two. And That's number three is the squares of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Wouldn't you know that Bucky has to pick the most complicated of Kepler's laws and use it as an example of how things are going. Any other comments or questions? If so you just keep that up, that I'll see the Kepler thing? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I just I would just like to say that all of these laws that they say, my approach to them is just to accept them as truth. And those truths are that, you know, the way I remember them is one, it is a formulation of a pattern identifier and identify, right? The formulation of a pattern identifier. You've 
identify a pattern like that around the sun, and you are formulating in such a way that anybody else wanting to experience that would take it and just apply and have guaranteed result. It allows predictability. And, uh, and, and all of these things, you know, like for example, if I make a comment on an ellipse, when you, when you talk about ellipse, you wrap back in terms, in terms of circular is an ellipse, it already have a certain consequence that there are two foci. And one of the foci is the sun. Here's the second here. is that there is a pattern that each of them, in order to have any balance in the system, has to have what you sweep in your orbit has to be a constant proportion of something. And the third law is how do you relate now the volume? Remember that you were talking about two dimension on the plan in terms of ellipse and in terms of area. Now it has to relate to something that is cubic. And it says it is the square of a planet orbit period. That is, you going now from the plane 2D to 3D is the proportional cube of the length of the semi-major axis of the orbit. And, and, and it's just like, I would like to have, have a feel of it and then I'll apply it, I'll try to accept it and apply it to things. And that will, I just find that it makes it easier for me. I don't know if you guys agree to it, but it makes me easier to say, here is a formula that somebody a lot smarter than me has put together, it's been accepted and is applied up till today, it hasn't been disproved, therefore accepted. I knew my, my brain is stuck at a, like a silly problem. I understand when it says in, in, in mod one that the orbit uses the sun as one of the foci, what defines foci number two? So what defines what, Susan? What defines focus number two? A line, which one? So it number says, two. so I'm looking at, at law number one, orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one of the two foci. Yeah. So I understand the sun is at one foci, so is there that is that is balance in one dimension. The ellipse, remember, is a line. It's one dimension. Yeah, and she's just asking. Okay, we get the sun is important, but how do we establish what focus number two is here? Focal point number two. And I can because I wrestle with it later, but um, it just that's the first question that pops into my brain. I'm like, oh. And interesting, here's focus number three, which must relate to law number three. So there it is. Focus, focus number two has to do with you being on a planet. What, what sweeps the constant area is a planet around the sun. Correct. Uh-huh. Right? There yeah. it is. For them not to collide, there's got to be a law. Hmm. Oh, and F relates to planet number two. I got that part now. Yes. So, so you have the sun. All planets orbit around the sun. Mm -hmm. Whether you are on Earth or Mars or Venus, you're going to orbit around the sun. But for Venus and Mars not to collide somewhere, you got to have a pattern that is established, that is going on and on. And that pattern has to be is governed by the amount of area that you are swept, okay? So you have that. Let's just say that all of those things have to sweep the total area of whatever sphere of the sun that it is. They will sweep, each is going to sweep a part of it that is going to be a constant and predictable part and there's a relation for it. And to understand that two dimension, you needed to understand first the, third, the three dimension. And the three dimension has to do with the third uh, law there. It is a law that always, according to its observation, 
it always applies. That's why it is a law. Mm. Remember that is not yet a principle. I was about to say that. That's a difference. Yeah, yeah, it is a law. It is the state of evolution to that time. And people have observed it and it hasn't been disproved. And it's been used to predict things. That's the way we accept it. To say, okay, there's the eclipse. According to your calculation, there's an eclipse now, or to your, to your theory, there's an eclipse that we should expect at this time, right? So if the, if the earth comes, the earth and the moon, for example, come into alignment at one point, then we have an eclipse. Eclipse, uh-huh. Yes, so that way we measure it. But until we have that eclipse, we can measure. Right, okay, that, that helps, thank you. Okay, if you want to continue, Joe. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Joe. Sure. Uh, synergetic behavior is omni manifest in biochemistry and metal metallurgy. Yeah. Synergy alone explains, for instance, why the tensile strength of chrome nickel steel is fifty percent stronger than uh, that the sum of all the its constituent alloys respective tensile strengths synergy is the backbone of general systems theory despite the powerful capabilities demonstrated by historical by synergetic strategy today's primary educational systems all around the world start the children's would-be education only with elementary parts of subdivisions which never explain the holistic behaviors and thus imply that science and technology may only be successful as a myriad of separate intricate specializations which can never be subject to a unified comprehension by one mind i i wish Anne were here i had just thought the same thing <laughs> that's exactly what i thought about this is that yeah. yes um, so he's just he's, he's introducing his uh his his, his, his his speech about specialization in that stuff or against specialization you know uh to the extreme yeah to the extreme in other words it's okay to talk about a part and talk about the uh the aspects of that part and then show how it interrelates and has a synergetic effect when combined with other things. So yeah. that we go in, take a look and come back out again, go in and come back out. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was thinking about this this week and uh, this week earlier is that if we were taught holistic thinking and how to think more critically and think in terms of the whole and uh, not in such specialized and narrow terms, um, you know, that would actually uh, upend, uh, you know, a, or would upset potentially a lot of power structures. And I, and I kind of feel like it's almost by design to keep us step specialized. I don't know, just a thought. Cool. Yeah, Manu, um, you and Susan were talking about w how a thing moves from a law into a general principle and, and Julian is asking that question. Do you want to explain uh, that process again? What's the difference oh, between good. law and a general principle, generalized principle? Okay, it all stems from the fact that we are experiencing from within, isn't it? Universe. So you are approaching with what you can measure. You are seeing that there are patterns. You observe those patterns. How do you, how are you going to establish that they apply everywhere? So you have to, the method, the scientific method is that of testing, always testing. Trying to repeat and it. You just, take, you just take one case to disprove whatever you spend a lifelong proving. In other words, it is true, 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 999 times Here at the thousands is not true, then you discard it. Or there's an exception, is no more considered to be a, a general principle. 
In other words, nothing is finite. What I mean finite in how we conceive. We conceive always, we generalize, and then we are open to changes. And if there is anything that comes to disprove it, then we reconsider. It's no more general. Mm -hmm. Let me take an example. Neutron, um, Newton's three laws were considered like principles until Einstein move higher with relativity. And then there is relativity that is coexisting with quantum mechanics. And Einstein spent his whole life trying to find the, what you call the unified field. He couldn't, maybe he's done today, I don't know. But there has been a lot of quest, a lot of ink spent on finding the way to reconcile quantum mechanics and relativity. So it's a that's what you call the quest for veritas. Mm. It is very veritas always assume that it is true until something happens. That's a lot better. Thank you, man. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, really cool. So Manu, just because. Um, yeah, I've, I've read into this, but I can't tell you that I know the answer to this. Um, so even when you have quantum mechanics coming in, gravity is still like the only generalized principle that I can think of. And do, do you consider that gravity is still a generalized principle or is it just a law? No, gravity, to me, gravity, radiation, all these are general, are general don't generalize. They are general, they are considered general principles. Okay. And, and, and then if even if you more generalize them, you come back to our discussion, discussion last Wednesday. It is still, it is still inter. What I'm trying to say is that there was electricity and magnetism. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is electromagnetism doesn't disprove that all the electrical principles still apply. They apply all the magnetics still apply. It's just that they apply together always. Hmm. So it takes me back to Philemon looking at us and going, hey guys, give me the list of generalized principles. And I think that that's something that I've always kind of hoped all these years of reading Bucky to kind of be able to come down and go, okay, well, here's the 14, here's the seven, but whatever number there is of generalized principles. And my sense is more that we're still on this veritas search mm -hmm. to identify those. And it's not a set number and we don't have a complete understanding. It's, That's it's, what you see in the Bible, riding on the shoulders of giants. I mean, you, you, it takes uh, some giant for you. To, I mean, Newton didn't invent whatever he did from scratch. Right. Kepler, Kepler was before Newton. Right. Da Vinci was before Newton. Yeah. The pyramids were built before Newton. So he has all of those stories. He has, he considered them and say, aha, they seem to be this. Let's posit it. And now let's test it against anything else. And he explained, and explained, and explained. During Newton's lifetime, he explained everything. And then there's this nerd that comes and say, mm, but um, this, so, let just me say this, so right? Sure and nobody lot. else dare say, despite coming so close to it. Mm -hmm. People, the mathematicians, they are theorists that came close to formulating relativity. And they didn't do. So it takes a dreamer to say, ah, I want to take a jump. That's it. 
So because you, remember, so, sorry, Susan, you just before. Remember that the more you have notoriety as a scientist, the more you have to defend some position and the less risk you will take. Because for a scientist, the nightmare is to say something that appears stupid. Right? So the acceptability in the society of scientists is going to be put in question. So that is okay. Sorry to. No, no. Okay, and, and actually, what I what I want to the question I want to put to you is actually puts us right there. Is if if you and I were alive in the time of Newton, would we have been tempted to call Newton's laws generalized principles? I would say yes because if you if you if you understood some science. But remember, Newton was fought by the powers of a day. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't that everything was accepted by every bank. I'm going to propose. And, oh, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm true. Okay, I'm going to propose another idea. I wonder if, um, if, if generalizations are more about the topology of thought and existence where laws are more about the topography of it all. In other words, Bucky is trying to give us a topology. How do I know I have mountainous? How do I know I have a thought? How do I know I have a structure? These are more, the topology is more generalized, whereas a law is much more about Here's the mountain and this is how tall it is. I'm wondering, I'm just asking that question. If a generalized principle is more topological and a law is more topographical. That sounds brilliant, Steve. Oh, <laughs> I've been trying to understand this topology thing. I go to sleep at night and say, what is topology for crying out loud? <laughs> so maybe it's a generalized principle. It was inspired by you, Susan. <laughs> Generally, what I learned, what I, what, what I, let me just say, it. one characteristic of topology is that the changes are not too big. Changes are what, Manu? Not the transformation. Mm -hmm. There's some limit. The top, or the topos of the topology are not too big. In other words, if you take dx, dx is not too big. That's why you have. Because if it's too big, you have this continuity. Got it. OK. Topology has a characteristic of continuity. I'm not saying that that's all the characteristic, but one that's one of those. Continuity. And I like what you just said, Manu, except that if I were a new guy saying that topology is about continuity, I wouldn't understand what you're saying. But having looked at topology for the last two years with this group, I actually get it. There's a continuity to it. In other words, structureness always occurs in these circumstances. It makes it, it's a continuous, it's a generalization. And it, and there are specifics that can be applied off of. So in a, in a weird sense, Mano, I get exactly what you're saying, but I can't explain it. <laughs> I can't explain myself. We have money. <laughs> But okay, you, you got me thinking. You got me thinking deeply about um, principles of life. Like some sometimes we think these are easy to put, as Susan was saying. Here's number fourteen. Here's number twelve, and we would like to have life like that. But sometimes it's more like um, this topological view that is generalized, like. It's happening to so many other people around the world that maybe it can happen to us, but it's not a not it's not a law, you know. <laughs> not everyone that's going to do that is going to end with uh, uh, that life result. That's what you got me thinking. Keep thinking. Do you see what do you see what has, what the comments are put there? I just prefer an example. It's an interesting way to look at it. 
Mm. And, and Julian, I, I think I am appreciating what you're saying. So when I, I was taught, you know, principles growing up, principles came from my, I, I was raised conservative Baptist, which is just a form of Christian. Um, and somebody who was raised in a different religion might have had different principles. And yet, if I had a way of pulling myself out of the society and getting a more macro view, uh, maybe maybe calling those laws would be more accurate. But yeah, it's almost like pulling yourself out of your local experience and looking at it from a distracted position. You get that sense of the shape of the thing, which is what I always think of with topology is the shape of how things relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Susan, let me, let me, I, I, I will, sorry, I would like us to really, because I, I kind of feel it elementary. Let me just put it that way. It is. Okay. When you take the Philippine wine dance, is there any break in the motion? We agree, right? There's no breaks in a Philippine right. wine dance. Is the topology? Yes. When you say mammal, is there any break in mammal? In what the essence of defining what the mammal is? I can certainly see looking at it from, from the sense of topology, yeah. Yeah, I see I see two characteristics of mammal. I'm not I'm no specialist. Let me and excuse me if you would be stupid, but I'm going to bear myself. One is sucking the breast. Two is not to be oviparous. What I mean is that, like not like birds. Birds have the eggs expel and hatch out. And see, I was going for hair bearing. <laughs> I don't know what, what. What I'm going to say is that our eggs are in and they develop in until expel fully kind of whatever it has to be to express it topographically to be. But those are like two, two things that don't change. And there is disruption, even the harmonious relationship of nature between that and the trees or between that and the and birds. You needed a quantum jump from birds to mammals is not something like this. It is accumulation, accumulation of things in a way, and then break, break out. That is about the way I feel, let's just put it, I feel topology. And it's all linked to that, the changes that are considered are tiny compared to what you call a break, a change. Does it make sense? I'm putting it out there. I think I'm, it's an again, I'm no specialist. I'm just saying what I feel. Comments, questions? That does not sound so crazy. Good. Okay. I was just thinking about this topology thing. I was looking back at one of the one of Kenny Kelly's handouts back in mm -hmm. 2020, and uh, regarding um, Bucky's synergetics 517.10 interface. Interference, interference phenomenon. Lines cannot go through the same point at Close. the same time. Yeah. And interference phenomenon. No two actions can go through the same point at the same time. The consequences of this can be pictured as follows. And then he has an A, B, C, D, F. And if I take off my blur, that's the picture there. Now, if you can see some of that. But that's from synergetics, I suppose. And maybe those pictures came from cosmography. I don't know. 
Thoughts going crazy. Any other comments or questions? Okay. What? No, I, I'm thinking about the principle and laws thing, even in, in sense of business, but I don't want to go down that road. Oh. Okay. Oh, I just thought I, I, I just saved this. So we're going to introduce every call with this. Right now, we're still on humanity. <laughs> For some reason, he got into uh, orbits of uh, orbits, Euler's laws, and we're talking about humanity. I'm, I'm, we're still in number two, I think. So let's continue to read. Oh, wait, that's Kepler. Oh, what the heck happened? Oh, wait, I know what it is. There we go. Oh, yeah. I just got to get down to where we are right now. Uh, we are. I know how to. I know how to get where we are real fast. Pardon me for lack of my navigation skills. Bam, Kepler's law. There we are. All right. Go ahead, Joe. Um. Let's see. Are we under spider? Special, we we're under specialization. No, we find, we find it. Okay. Specialization. Yeah, work. specialization. Yeah. Specialization, there from today's chain reaction of self accelerating fraction, fractionation of all thinking into exploding uh, categories resulted. Probably categories. It's probably yeah. a typo. It could be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, resulted from the old master pirates pre First World War synergetic strategy by which they required that all the bright lieutenants and experts confine their labor and inquiry to differentiation, and that each must mind his own business and must askew all integration which they must concede to be the old master pirate's exclusive prerogative. Yeah. I think eschew means to forsake or disavow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what eschew means, right? It's a legal, semi-legal term. Definition, eschew. Eschew. Deliberately avoid, abstain from. That's what eschew means. It's a legal term. So, and I love his use of pirates. I mean, you know, if you, if you, if I look at historically how pirates evolved, you know, they were just people, it's the Robin Hood syndrome. The way I see pirates, they were just people who are victimized constantly by imperialism from Spain and Portugal and England and, you know, the Dutch and all these European countries going out trying to exploit these resources and Every, every once in a while, somebody stood up and became a pirate, and they were doing unto the pirates the way they were doing unto everybody else. I love this word pirates. I think that's really cool. I slightly differ from you, Steve. Yeah. Is that every pirate had a master. It was just the talk of war of different masters. Yeah. They were trying to steal from another master. That's all. That's right. The king of Spain, the king of Portugal. Yeah. The, Whoever, you know, <laughs> they, they have, whoever has the power, had his own, you know, they were mercenaries. Right. At the service of a master. And eschew all integration, right? Avoid the cosmic accounting, right? Yeah. And just say, how do we increase our quarterly profits, right? I think by integration, it's our, yeah. also the macro view. Yeah. Or a gener generalized view as opposed to a specialist view. Yeah. No, but what what is also saying there is that, you know, I see the general and I want to capture it. Therefore, I compartmentalize whatever is the content of that and I make sure that those don't communicate in such a way that I still, everything else that come out of it still accrues to me. That's why he call it, if you read that word, he call it uh, a special or something, itis, to say is a sickness, mm. you know, in the paragraph before. 
So categories. Category uh, categorities. Categorities. Yeah. yeah. So it is is it, I think that the point that way is going through all of this is to say that children are put into categories and they are forced into categories forever. Therefore, mm -hmm. their, their thought is always going to be suboptimal because they don't have what Becky always says that the macro view and then you go local. Macro first and then, and then you go into the application, the locality of it. Now, in order to do that, it seems to me, and this is a big epiphany for me in the last couple of years as we've been talking about this, is I cannot see, and this is what he's saying in these words we're reading, I'm, it's too easy to fractionalize and look at something outside of the system in which it was created and developed. I, I isolate it and say, oh, you know, here's a fish. It's a beautiful fish. I pull it out of the water and I bring it up and it's dead, right? Because I didn't think that the fish needs to be in the water, right? Because I'm not looking at the cosmic accounting of it all. And so one of the things that I'm really looking at is when I look at something, look at it in a system. Right. So if I walk out and I see a tree, I don't just see a tree. I see the system that supports the tree. The tree does not exist without the system and without the comprehensive total picture. And if I say, oh, this is a beautiful tree, I'm going to chop it down and make a house out of it, I become a pirate. <laughs> and, and see what you're getting at. And I, I think it's communicated very succinctly in Brunch of Giants, but definitely in Critical Path was this whole idea that the kings and the priests decided that they owned the generalized concept of everything. And one of the ways they subjugated the population was to define that, divide them into specializations. And what was interesting was that, and I know I'm trying, I think it, I can't remember which of you lovely gentlemen came the Bond of Ashiva and Russell Brandt discussion and they were talking about in the past as you know, I India as a British colony, the, sub the way that people would declare their divisions was initially as their profession. Right. And then eventually it became more to the advantage of the ruling elite to have them declare their divisions by religion. And so it's, it, that what to me was like this very aha moment of, of seeing how the kings and the priests, the government um, was using the strategy of division, of specialization to be able to reshape how they would push each of us and the populist against each other. Right. Because right. if there was a category for Hugh being we could all check that box and we would be the many and they would be the few. But if we, if they can divide us into Hindu and Muslim and Christian and Buddhist, then they've just, they've just created ways that they can come in. They've divided us against each other and then they can come and ride herd on top of us. That's what I was saying a little bit earlier with the whole idea of thinking holistically, like the reason why they can't have people think holistically, because it challenges current power structures. That's exactly what I meant, it, you know, whether it be and this is, you know, why philosophical thinking is so challenging to established, you know, again, established orders, uh, whether it be governments, religions, whatever it may be. Yeah, and that's only it's the only road to utopia versus oblivion. Right. And by saying that thinking holistically challenges power systems is the same thing as this cosmic accounting and quarter. It's problems. exactly what it is. It's and the same they're just exactly. and for some reason, we I don't think normally unless if we're this call, 
I wouldn't normally be putting all those together in one context. Mm -hmm. I would have my economic discussion over here and I'd have my political discussion over here. And just by fractionalizing that whole conversation, it weakens every any part. argument, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it weakens every argument and people are unable to communicate. Yeah. With each other. Yeah, because I'm arguing about quarterly profits and you're talking about holistic thinking. Right. right. Exactly. And, I, as opposed and I'm not to connecting the that dots. We're, that we're both were in this together. Yeah. No, I mean, we, I see this even organizationally where I work. Is that, you know, they look at people that do financial analysis or budgets as totally separate from what they do. And it's kind of like, well, no, it's really, we're kind of in the same boat. Um, but, it, you know, they're like, oh, all one group is concerned about their reality, their numbers. And the other group is just concerned about what they can build and so it's 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 interesting and the invitation right. to macro perspective is is what is gonna help us it's it, the word is integration the word is synergy it's that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and so and i, I guess i i love it i'm trying to work with these things in my own business and we have decided on a kind of a decentralized governance so that there's at least four committees that are working at different parts of the business. But then once a month, everybody has to come together and we have to integrate all that information um, and then look at it all together. We, you know, we, there's a number of us that are partners and we have to have a general view and we have to make fiduciary decisions about how do we move this enterprise forward? And yes, we will each have a different micro perspective. And, you know, a mid-level we've been divided into like four different like um, categories for like one is operations and finances and business development, you know, these different ideas. And if we don't come back and integrate, then each one of us can't be responsible as a fiduciary center of power for moving the whole enterprise forward. And that's how it is for humanity. And yet so many people, so many of us, and I conclude myself are sometimes willing to be pushed down into these subdivisions. You know, I'm a, I'm a cisgen, now it's getting crazy, man. I'm a cisgendered, heterosexual, middle-aged, white woman. I mean, I didn't used to have to say that I was cisgendered or heterosexual, but now I do. So the divisions have become like, I was on a Zoom call for an investment meeting and each of the young folks had their preferred pronouns on their Zoom page, their Zoom tile. It's like, fuck, let's divide us further. Come on, let's do it. So anyways, I'm gonna start ranting. <laughs> well, no, Susan, I love what you said. I just, I had to look up cisgender the other day and I just had to look it up again. I mean, it's, I hear it every day. It's being used every day. And I just had to look it up again, denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with their birth sex. <laughs> yeah. So the only, the only form of life lower than me on the current food chain, <laughs> Joe and Steve. <laughs> can, I, can I share something here? Please. <laughs> And I'll, and I'll back off, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Let's take proposition one. <laughs> Human beings can, at the time, only see partially. At one time. So we only live one phase actively, right? Whatever it is. The second thing is, in order to remember, we need to color it, to put a label, to tag it, so that when it comes back, we remember it. And our challenge will always be that with luck and putting together, let us build it 
for the purpose for which it was built. That is for a higher purpose. Let us not appropriate it. And then you see this. This is what I'll call integrity. Let's look at my left hand is integrity. My right hand is cosmic accounting. Cosmic accounting means to me, very detailed and recorded accounting of all the aspects of my experience from within. Is there need that in what I'm building, I'm always going to have this in a dance, a tango dance. So we need to sanitize our cosmic accounting and let it just be the tool that it is. So maybe it helps me to see Susan and represent who Susan is in a white skin, in a long hair, in whatever label that I is. But when I'm now, I build this Susan, let's remember that Susan is a UV. And interact or use at that level, that is human to human. And that has been the challenge. And, it's, it, and, it, and it, it also connotate what we were talking about, about piracy, the pirate or the master appropriating something that is them. Because now with our cosmic accounting, we've been able to, the, to see clearly that we are 98% the same as a chimp. We've been able to see that there is no difference in what we label black, white, and all these things. All these consideration, normally if we're doing accounting, should be vainglorious. So our challenge is to sanitize the labels that we put onto our divisions and use them only for what they are, parts that can be put together in order to aspire higher, not to appropriate. That's the way I will comment and understand it. Complete? You good, Mana? Yep. Good. Any other comments or questions? What a stirring discussion. What a stirring discussion. I put the cisgender thing down below there. Okay, good. Now we get to read another paragraph for Anne. <laughs> Go ahead. Thus, the elementary educational system, which is which in contrast to synergy, starts exclusively with a few parts or elements, leads at best only to differentiated statistical probability based entirely in the separate behaviors of those elementary parts. Probability, the strongest tool of statistics, which deals only with parts, and its best is at, at its best is a weak tool. Were probability strong, it would predict stock market behavior with precision and would foretell horse race results with reliability. Contrawise, synergy and general systems theory, a powerful forecasting tool and have been for the backbone of modern physics, astronomy, and chemistry. My 14 concepts, taken one by one and considered only in the separate elementary educational manner might seem too special to and to do and to diffuse to be effective taken all together synergetically i hope you will find them as promising as i have already found them to be if i had not been consciously and deliberately pursuing all 14 concepts synergetically and teleologically for the last 38 years and if i had not obtained innumerable practice results, I would not be in a position now to, to, to know you 
to know you and to be asked to exchange grand strategy information with you. Okay, I'd like to pause there. Sure. Because he says synergetically, we've got that synergy is this thing that that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So that's what that synergetic is. And the teleological is purpose. Yeah, is base is results oriented. I think teleology is I'm gonna look it up to make sure. It's a, I think it's it's purpose. It's and I'm sure it relates to that. Relating to or involving the explanation of phenomena in terms of the purpose that they serve rather than the cause. Right. Relating to the doctrine of design and purpose. Okay, purpose is a key word. Thank you, Joe. Okay, cool. Oh, and uh, any other comments on what we've read so far? Just to remember, here are the 14 concepts. That's why Becky is always insisting on start with the macro, start with the generalize, general first. Or and then start with the system. Yes, general means system. Yeah. That's if, well, anyway. On a, personal, on a personal little bit, that's kind of sweet that Bucky says, because I pursued this stuff for 38 years, it put him in a position at the moment he was writing that to know me. And that's what exactly we just talk about some, you know, like on during this discussion is that we are seeing from inside and I see something and then I test it, test it, test it, test it, test it. The more I test, the more courage it gives me to come out and share it with you. Because whenever I share something that is more than whatever is the accepted or that challenging the accepted belief of the time, I'm putting myself at risk, isn't it? I'm a risk taker. I'm putting myself at risk and I progress. He's saying that for 38 years, his life experience has been that one. He's discovered that thing. And as, as, as testified by the thousands of uh, Patents and I don't know how what it is that he's saying, and it's just like Jesus said in the Bible, right? Isn't I think it was to Thomas or 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 he was saying that the evidence of my miracle is it not enough for you to believe, mm. right? That's I'm not right. trying to preach here. I'm just giving citing something vaguely in the bible that reflect this we can only know by experience and by induction that's the way induction is a way of taking risk of moving from your particular case to say hey i can put my neck out to say that this apply more generally and risk being proven wrong by the test of many many people that hey because guess what? The first person who hear you say it is going to go and test it. <laughs> and those yeah. are your children. <laughs> All right. Okay. Joe, you want to continue? Uh, absolutely. Um, let me see. Uh, I think we're at within. Is that where we are? Okay. Yeah, I think yes. so. Yeah. Yes. This is 38 years. Yep. Uh, within the last 14 years, thousands of my structures have gone to 50 countries around the SS spaceship Earth. They were most frequently transported to their sites by air, fully assembled or in systematically coded and tightly packaged parts. I have succeeded, therefore, within only 38 years in demonstrating the validity of my proposal published in 1927 to commerce in 25 years 1952, the air delivery of high performance environment controls for those of mankind's activities most advantageously performed under scientifically protected and valued conditions. 
1953, the U.S. Marine Corps made the first air delivery of my geodesic dome, fully assembled and skinnied, flying it to its site by helicopter at 36 nautical miles per hour. I prof professed this is 25 years. I look 26. <laughs> it looked 26. I'm sorry. It, yeah, but it, it, that's it took. Thing. It's probably a missed call. Okay. I was like, it looked, okay. Well, yeah, this right. is the problem with reading, Joe, and you, you got typos all through and you're straining through it really, really well. So congratulations. Yeah. And, uh, one of the words I, I misspoke up there was a uh, uh, contrarian wise. I said contra wise. I, was, yeah. I misspoke. But yeah, I, I, when I went back, I was looking at it. Uh, the year in which I first made this proposal, 1927, was that in which Lindbergh, uh, Lim, is it Limbra? The Lindenberg. Lindbergh. Or Lind Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh. Oh, in which Lindbergh, yeah. The guy Lindbergh, in the Lindbergh. Yeah, okay, yeah. Lindbergh made well, his. Well, it is Lindenberg, isn't it? Lindenberg? Linden Lindbergh. Uh, yeah, Lindbergh. I mean, I don't know how that's, is that right? In Afrikaans, Lindbergh. Lindbergh. In German, Lindbergh. That's how you spell Lind Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. Yep, that's it. Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh. Officer. Yep. Oh, I was thinking, yeah, okay. He is the aviator that went across. Uh, yeah, can I? We'll, we'll let him talk about it. Go ahead. Uh, made his epical non stop New York City to Paris flight uh, in a aeroplane with cloth covered wings international aeroplane passenger service was not even not as yet even seriously discussed jet propulsion rocketry television vision transition uh, transistors uh, cellophane tape computers highway uh, clo uh, clover leaves staplers stainless steel high strength aluminum uranium the Great Crash, the Depression, Hitler, the Second World War, juvenile delinquency, and atomic bombs were unanticipated and uh, unthoughtful, unthought of, <laughs> or held to be only fantastic pro uh, possibilities realizable, if at all, 1,000 years hence. Discussions of rocket trips to the moon were engaged in only by lun by lunatics in mental institutions. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, only 23 years ago, when I attended Second World War meetings in Washington, D.C., I was often greeted by someone saying, please don't ruin this meeting by once again introducing your preposterous mass produced scientifically designed air deliverable houses. <laughs> well, that's interesting. OK. Yeah. Any comments so far on anything that, that Joe's read to this point? Perspective. Where's John Butler? Yeah. Yeah, the idea of perspective. In fact, you know, there have been research done at where they've asked people to predict what's going to go on in their life over the next five years. And people are absolutely continually underestimating the outcomes in five years. Um, it's like things happen in the universe exponentially and the brain thinks linearly. And here is Bucky thinking exponentially, you know, perhaps. Any other yeah. comments or questions? That's a tough one. I mean, I, I, yeah, the rate of innovation. Yeah. It, it, that, that's, uh, that's a tough <laughs> thing to discuss. Well, is, have is you, also... you guys, what's that, Julian? Is it also that related also with the complexity of probability, like understanding all the probabilities to predict? Uh, that is something that our brain is just not wired to do. Wired to do exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. One of the one of the one of my mentors, a guy by the name of um, Marco Harrelson, had a book called "How to Wake Up the Financial Genius Inside of You," and one of his great uh, 
the things that he uh, liked to talk about was this idea of would you rather have a dollar a day for the next or a thousand dollars a day for the next 30 days or would you rather have one penny compounded over the next 30 days and um that you know most people have no concept of what a penny compounded can do over over um 30 days, 30 days. And yeah and i'm almost ready to uh um what was the number uh, I'm going to see if I have it already down here. Be, uh, remember back when um, when the virus first came out, I showed a chart which blew me away. And then my, I was starting to real estate. I was starting to teach my real estate people um, about the fact that money grows like the virus. <laughs> you know, it starts off little and doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles. And and Susan knows that when you've got a a little a conception of a human being inside of that womb it starts off as like this one cell joined by another cell and then it starts to divide and it goes from two to four to six to eight and there are like several stages of that fetus uh, and probably susan you, i wish i were i wish i had instant recall of this stuff but they have different names for it when it hits certain numbers of cells critical mass or time you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of like so trophoblast and fetus yeah. and embryo, you know, so embryo versus fetus. And, yeah. But yeah. the law of compound, one of the most dramatic illustration for it is that imagine a football stadium. I, I guess a football, an American football stadium and a rugby stadium or a soccer stadium. They are, they are about the same, similar size, at least in terms of world comparison. You know, the, you know compare, comparing to our, our size. And imagine that you have a drop of water, the size of a drop that doubles every second or every minute. How long do you think that it would take for it to completely submerge the stadium? No idea. Your guess is what? I have no idea. But what is your guess? How long for wait a minute every second or every minute every minute for example every you know is doubling let's just put it every second every second every second but it's doubling the yes. um, the number of one drop one drop per drops. second yeah one drop per, you can feel a drop per second so it doubles every time at every cycle it doubles how long will it take to fill the stadium? Just so, give me another. 60 hours, I don't know. So then what, what will you say? Don't be influenced by him. Get yourself. Okay. 12 hours. Should be more than that. I'm going to say 12 hours. <laughs> so let's continue. As there, Steve, you haven't come up. Yeah, I'm 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 working on a spreadsheet to to uh, compound that penny one time <laughs> every a few minutes. So I'll, but it's hard for me to do that when uh, when I'm uh, sharing this. But I think I just figured out a way to do it. So Joe can continue to read. I think. Wait, no, Joe, Joe, okay. you, you okay. have to answer. We I gotta have to get the answer to this. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer, Julian? Um, I have a guess. I can say that. Maybe sixty-four hours. Okay. Can I can I give what is proven? Yes. What? Minutes. What? Yes. Minutes. Minutes. So in terms of environmental pollution, we are at the twenty-third hour of a twenty-four hour cycle. We're literally one hour from catastrophe. You get me? I want to see because that stadium. Of our inability to really be able to focus and our vanity in recognizing that we're that incapable. Okay, well, I've I just built my compounding chart, so it'll be as mind blowing as uh, as Manu's example mm -hmm. here, and it as totally unpredictable. So That's here's crazy. Here's a thousand dollars a day <laughs> for 
uh, the next 30 days. So if I grab this little box up here and I drag it over here, um, you can see that at the end of 30 days, if I shrink this down- You just have 30 grand, time, yeah. I have 30 grand, right? I'm gonna have to shrink it down one more slot. All right, and then after the end of 10 days, I've got, if I'm compounding my penny and I earn 100% compound interest, then at end of 10 days, I've got uh, $5.12. <clears throat> so at this point, the guy that's getting a thousand bucks a day is really think he's cool. But then we get down to 20 days and we've got $20,000 at $1,000 a day, but we got $5,000 in compounding. And, and that at this point, the guy's getting $1,000 a day go to sleep like the turtle, uh, like the tortoise and the hare, right? But look what happens at the end of 30 days, $5 million. Wow. Because it all humps up here at the last, because it's compounding, it's doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling, and our brain does not do that. And I read that in a book back in 1977 from Mark Harrelson. I started teaching for Mark Harrelson. Uh, and that's back in 77 that I learned this concept. And, uh, but the human brain does not get compounding. And that's exactly the way the virus grows. I saw a chart on the virus um, and I presented it on a Bucky call here a while ago with Kelly back a few years ago. Let me see if I can get my, let's see if I have something under virus. But see, that's what we've been saying all the time. Spherical mean exponential. That's what it means. Spherical means exponential. Right on. So all the logarithm application, the exponential and all of this, the 10 to the power, that's what it is. Wow. I remember reading a book when I was a kid called The Law of Abundance. And it talked about how many tomato seeds come out of a tomato. And it's beyond comprehension. Yeah, nature is compounds constantly. Um, it just, it's beyond comprehension. Any other mm -hmm. comments or questions? Good, shall we continue to read? Sure. Um, let's see. Such, uh, you know, okay, as yeah. a consequence. As a consequence, that's where it is. Okay, good. As a consequence of my finding both the metaphysical and physical subdivisions of the of universe to be finite, I have also discovered the finite arithmet arithmetical arithmetical me no. medical arithmetical arithmetical, arithmetical. arithmetical. Uh, he just geometrical words. Go ahead. geometrical energetical <laughs> rationally coordinate comprehensive mens uh, mensuration system employed by nature to rationally integ integrate the physical and metaphysical and have thereby also provided a conceptual and definite bridge of understanding between the humanities and the sciences. I am confident that the comprehensiveness of my 14 concepts rather than being over ambitious represents the min max femex uh, min, uh, minimum and maximum family of prime variable factors uh, uniquely governing general systems system theory. <laughs> so mim, min 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 max min max fam max. I think I'm going know. to print that in a t-shirt. But that's yeah. what it is, is that, for example, an application of V that he came out is the tetrahedron. Mm. The tetrahedron is the minimum universe. It's still that universe. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah. It's just the universe in there transforming, folding and folding until it reaches a minimum where it cannot go. And when it reaches that minimum, Rhythm, it has to go to the maximum. Yeah. Unless something stop it on the way to becoming maximum. Yeah. So if I live into it and I understand that, then I will understand that there are seasons. Right. Then I will be able to adjust myself if I understood that 
or to do something about those seasons. So all these things that call the black swan ending is because in our system of doing, what we call our systems of application, we didn't build or we didn't do anything about, even acknowledging that could happen. Right on. Until a black swan decided that I have to go from Africa or from Australia, I have right. to travel this way. I'm, you know, I want to experience freedom. And then the people who are on the other side of planet Earth say, ah, there's a black swan. That is a surprise. Right. And their behavioral way is going to be that of a tulip, a mm. mania, yeah. a yeah. mania. But I happen to know that that black swan didn't decide. That black swan got caught up in a giant hurricane and just got taken over there. It exactly. wasn't. It wasn't a conscious choice. <laughs> I don't know. It just. It just joy and joy, uh, uh, respectfully. What nature offers you? What is offered you on this? Enjoy respectfully. Yeah, it reminds me of being on this call. I start out in Australia and suddenly I'm in Africa. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. It's about time we're going to end our call. Julian, if you have a voice at all and you can share, how are you feeling and what's your takeaway today? Oh, well, uh, I think I forgot. Um, my heart and my throat was hurting for lots of time during this call. So I think that's uh, making me really happy. Um, I I got lots of new findings. Uh, generalized principles versus law. Um, how can we talk about macro to micro and specialization? Um, Manu was giving lots of good analogies. Um, how we were thinking about topology and topography principles of life, um, how to think holistically, um, how thinking like that, and Joe steps into and says, oh, that's going to challenge the power system. So um, that's lots of, uh, and I can keep going. Like there's lots of things that, that I really like uh, a lot about this, this call. So. Mm, that's what I um, would like to keep, and I, I, I will. I think I, I will consider seriously to print in a T-shirt, min max, fun max. <laughs> that's it. So with that, um, Susan, how do you feel today, and what do you take away? Um, I am super grateful for the time with. All of you gentlemen and Julian, thank you for the t-shirt idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whether, whether it becomes a shirt or not, I've got the idea. Um, I am just really taken with the invitation to more generalized macro view and what it could mean for the possibility of allowing humanity, um, human beingness, to uh, to achieve that utopia at um, at direct odds with the the very few that would want to force us you know as kings and priests would like to take away our metaphysical birthright that would like to force us into a, a physical only existence that would like to force us into a specialized way of thinking that's divided one against another that is fiction. We really are all in this together. And I, I feel grateful to spend time with other people who feel the spontaneously arousable call of Buckminster Fuller and to look more deeply and to have the patience to keep going back to basic definitions and make sure that we're on stable datum together to try and build a concept that's bigger than any one of us. Manu, how do you feel and what are you taking away? I feel happy. I feel grateful. 
And I feel that we had a productive exchange today. What I take away is just reinforce principles, cosmic integrity, cosmic accounting. And then it boils down to me in terms of attitude. I think that attitude is very important because attitude determine resistance or openness, tolerance or acceptance, question. That is all attitudinal, right? Is that the right word? So, and it boils down to, in terms of self-discipline, that humility to recognize that we coexist on this spaceship Earth. And, and, and really accepting that coexistence forces me to put aside things that are, that are not important to focus what, on what should be important for our survival, for our thriving in the company of all the other creatures of this earth until nature decides that, okay, our time is up. And that's the way, that's what I take away is humility, really acknowledging all of you guys' contributions and being thankful. Um, Joe, how do you feel? What do you take away? I feel I feel very grateful as well, um, as always, you know, the time that we get to spend together um, and that people have, you know, similar interests to me. Uh, it's uh, reassuring um, on a number of levels, uh, both personally and as far as, you know, as far as uh, on, on a um, on a grander scale. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm thinking away today. Actually, one of the things that I actually had not read for years is just this one paper it was basically the foundations for understanding theory and principles. And um, what I really want to do is actually go and put, you know, in, in, um, I used to think about these things a lot about how laws and principles and what was differentiated them. Uh, and how they worked within frameworks. Um, I, I used to think about those things quite a bit and I used to be able to articulate them a little bit more clearly. So I think I'm going to spend a little time with this document, which I actually found to be very helpful. Uh, so that's a very important thing for me. Um, I actually, I really enjoyed uh, how Susan explained how divisions work. Um, in the sense of how religious divisions work against, you know, power structures or work for power structures in many cases, uh, and how that related back to what we were discussing a little bit earlier in the idea of specialization uh, and how we're taught to think about things in the world and how we communicate with one another. I thought that that was interesting. Um, and that's something that um, that's that'll be worth listening to for that, that span of the tape as well or the video um, you know Kelly I miss Kelly uh, oh an expensive cost that's what I want to come back to I that, it's in my Bucky book actually um, that I cannot find right now which is causing a great deal of anxiety to me personally uh, if I can't find that soon I'll be a little bit I'll be um, unhappy. I'll just say that. Um, uh, but expense and cost was one of the first things that we actually cover uh, in some of these calls that we're really actually making, you know, making that distinction and understanding the difference between the two is, is really important. Uh, and seeing the relevance of even cosmic accounting overall. Um, very interesting thought experiment with the interest and the drop of water to fill the stadium. 
Uh, I still want to see that stadium, but uh, in any case, um, so there are a lot of different takeaways for me today and actually a couple of takeaway actions as well. So I'm very, uh, um, very grateful for the call. Steve, how are you doing and what would you like to take away from today? Or what are, your, what are your takeaways from today? Well, I'm just really excited that I was able to hit that spreadsheet and do that compounding thing because I got stuck there for a minute. I was going, what? How does this work? <laughs> but I realized I had to multiply the thing by itself. That was what it is. That's what compounding, 100% periodic return is compounding. The thing multiplied by itself over a number of periods and how fast 30 periods of a penny is mind boggles, $5 million, whoa. So obviously my brain likes to keep things really small. I was really excited tonight about this whole thing. I, again, with everybody, I had a real sense of epiphany about the, about generalized principle being a top, a topological approach and then rules being more of a topographical, you know, what is a mountain? That's topology. How high is this mountain? How, how do we measure this mountain? That's topography. There's, there's rules about measuring mountains. But what is a mountain is a generalized principle. And by the way, a few a year ago, I did that research. What's the difference between a mountain and a hill? And back in the 1800s, as late as the 1920s, I think, the US and the UK had said a mountain is anything over 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet. And in the 1920s, they got rid of that. There's no differentiation between a hill and a mountain. Uh, and in fact, if you look up the definition, what's the difference between a hill and a mountain? It says a mountain is harder to climb. That's what it says. <laughs> I mean, and so, you know, here we go dealing with topology and topography anyway. And I just, I'm, I'm busting a gut because while you guys were talking, I had this big vision about, about the wow. tetrahedron. And these are graphics I stole off the web just in the last couple of seconds. A tetra, the dual of a tetrahedron is a tetrahedron. Yes. This is another reason why uh, Bucky talks about the tetrahedron being the basic structure. If you take the dual of a cube is an octahedron, and the mm. dual of an octahedron is a cube. And so it goes cube, octahedron, cube, octahedron, cube, octahedron, cube, octahedron, forever and ever and ever inside. And this is topology. In other words, this is a fractal. This over here is a fractal also probably, but it's weird. It goes one thing, then another thing, then back to the first thing, then to another thing. But this can go on forever. And topographically, uh, topologically, topological definitions are fractalizable hmm. because a tetrahedron topologically is a tetrahedron and can have another tetrahedron inside of it. Anyway, this whole idea of topology, I sleep with this at night, trying to figure out what topology is. And once again tonight, I'm so glad, Joe, that you remembered that teleology has to do with purpose. Now, it's so funny that here I am a human being. I'm over 70 years old, and I don't know the definition of teleology. It's like the last thing they taught me in school was about purpose. Right. They didn't teach me. They didn't care if I understood purpose. They just wanted me to do their job for them, do some job. And the idea of, well, what's your purpose? You know, I think that's, I think when people get to that, that's, I, you know, I've had that midlife crisis maybe two or three times. And I'm suddenly, I'm actually coming up with a topological definition of purpose. Anyway, so I just love this whole conversation. There's no place I would rather be than right here with you people. And let's, you know, more will join us as they do, as they may. I'm going to send a special message to Anne with those uh, things about elementary school. I'm going to send that off to her. And Julie, I'm so delighted that you made your commitment. I mean, being, you know, be, knowing you were going to be 30 minutes beyond time would have been easy just to say, well, I'll catch it next week. But you added a lot to the call. I'm so glad you made it. So can I, can I put the button in quick? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just to all, two quizzes and then a quiz and a reminder. Mm. Uh, or not a quiz. I mean, and it's been just think about critical mass as, as this compound in action, finiteness 
is companion to a certain level and then momentum. You get me? They start compounding. At one point you stop, but the compounding had momentum. Yeah. So you eject into orbit a new being. Yeah. Do you get what I'm trying to say? It, yeah. it, it ejects, it put into orbit a new life. That's why it says, it yeah. says critical mass. You've arrived at a level where, say, for example, for a human being, is about six months in the womb. Under normal nutrition and condition, it can be expelled. Second thing that I would like you to take away is we've always talked, remember we talk about the first derivation of the tetrahedron, the second derivation and the third. We have that all the time. A tetrahedron, when you do the first derivation by joining the meat points of edges, you have an octahedron and tetrahedron. Now, if you go now and cut the octahedron by three plane, you're defining the cube, aren't you? Let me say it again. In terms of the fractals and the dwarfs that Steve was talking about. If you take a tetrahedron and then you first do the first division, just take every edge, you put the midpoint, and then you join those points. You're gonna have an octahedron. Mm. If now you take the octahedron, you do the same exercise by cutting it by three planes, like that, and like that, we've done it before, you have a cube. Think about it. That is the quiz. Yeah. If you can sleep tonight, you know. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, going to go really. back to sleep, definitely. But <laughs> I'm just leaving it. I'm just saying, you know, really, that understanding. I, I, I think that when we we're trying to talk about it, can you can you stop the recording? Uh, I'm, you yeah. want me to stop the recording? Yes. Well, okay. Is that legit?